My name's Kevin, Kevin Adler, Kevin F. Adler. And actually the middle initial is my middle name uh, was my mom's maiden name, which is uh, Farrington. And I use it intentionally to give her every bit of credit that I possibly can. Because she was both the kindest person that I ever met, as well as the strongest person I ever met. And to combine those two in one person was a gift to my brother and I. Uh, so I'm the founder and CEO of a nonprofit called Miracle Messages. And I'm also the author of a book that just came out last month called When We Walk By. And uh, I've shared a link if you'd like to get a copy of When We Walk By. I'll share more about the book and how you can get involved in really this movement um, at, uh, that, that my work is trying to catalyze. So first, I'd like to share this, this photo here probably at first glance seems unremarkable. But in what I'm going to share in the next 60 seconds, uh, you're never going to forget this photo and you're never going to forget about what I'm going to say. And here's why. So uh, a few years ago, neuroscientists at Princeton and Duke did an experiment uh, where they did a study. And in this study, they researched how the part of our brain that activates when we see a person compared to say an inanimate object, that part of the brain is called the medial prefrontal cortex. And that part of the brain has been found by these researchers not to activate when we see someone that we perceive to be in an extreme outgroup in our society, including people experiencing homelessness. The parts of the brain that do activate when we see someone who's experiencing homelessness are the left insula and the right amygdala. These are the parts of the brain that are associated with disgust. When you see, say, vomit or something gross, you kind of have that uh, feel. That's the parts of the brain that activate when we see someone we perceive as experiencing homelessness. What are the real world implications of this? Well, a few years ago, the New York City Rescue Mission did an experiment where they had individuals dress up to look homeless as unsuspecting members of their very own family walked by. And in each instance of this experiment, not a single person recognized their own son or daughter, brother or sister, husband or wife, or in this lady's case, her mom and her dad. And I think that leaves us with a question that I've thought about a lot. And I'm just going to ask and let you think about for a moment. Would you recognize your loved one if they were on the streets? So this photo here is some of my loved ones. My grandparents, my mom, top right, my brother. That's me at the bottom left. I don't know what kind of pose I'm doing, but, you know, watch for it. I might still do it. And there in the middle. That's my uncle, Mark. Uh, Mark was my favorite member of my extended family. He remembered every birthday. Every year, he sent me a birthday card, always with his name just scrawled at the bottom. Mark also suffered from schizophrenia. And he lived on the streets of Santa Cruz for 30 years. But I you know, never thought of Uncle Mark as a homeless man, because he was just my beloved uncle. And it wasn't until after Uncle Mark passed away at the age of 50, that I started thinking, gosh, everyone I'm walking by, that's someone's son or daughter, brother or sister, maybe some kid's beloved uncle or aunt. So I was sitting at the gravesite with my dad, and we had a really powerful father-son conversation. And I was asking him about the significance of having a gravesite for his younger brother. You know, we hadn't exactly been frequent visitors to the gravesite since he had passed away. So what was the intention here? And he said, you know, this was a man who never had a permanent resting place in life. But now in death, he has uh, something, you know, that's his eternal spot. And I, I was really moved by, my, by what my dad said. But I also thought, gosh, you know. All the stuff that made Mark Mark, all the good stuff, all the memories, and also all the struggles, all the suffering, all the pain that he endured, 
all of that is in the dash between birth and death. All those, all the good years are in the dash. All the stories are in the dash. There's got to be a better way to commemorate a life and, and maybe share stories of people like my uncle Mark than a gravesite. And so I just started thinking about how could we use storytelling tools to help people like my uncle Mark share their story. And uh, my my what got on my heart after thinking about this quite a bit was um, this photo here. So I started a project for one year where I invited 24 individuals experiencing homelessness to wear GoPro cameras around their chests and narrate their experience of what life is like on the streets. And the basic premise was pretty simple. I just walked by you. You're still here. What's it like to be you? What do you wish people like me, passersby, knew that maybe we don't? And, uh, and I actually believe if the audio works, I think I actually have a short clip to share of one of those early video recordings. So let's get your audio ready and, and hopefully you can hear this. Oh, let's see. I got to allow the microphone. Let's try it again. Okay, one more. Let's try one more time. There we go. My name is Adam Riker. I'm living in San Francisco. Um, I've been homeless on and off for like almost six years now. For most people that are homeless, I hear it from friends and I see it, don't have any type of real interaction that means anything to them when you're homeless because people treat you so much different. About 90% of these people that care less about standing in front of them or not, you know? I mean, most of them would not want to see me out. would rather not see me at all out there. And it, you know, when I say that, I don't mean see me out here being homeless. They would just rather not see me out here at all. You know, and it's, I guess, the way that society is turning where they look at me like I'm below them or something like that. And they don't realize it. Like I said earlier, that, you know, a lot of people that I know right here in this neighborhood, the Castro, are living paycheck to paycheck. Wonder if they're going to be housed next week. How you doing, folks? Tomorrow's my birthday. I'm trying to get a hotel. I'm going to get a paper. You know what I mean? I spent Christmas out here. So I, I watched uh, dozens of hours of footage. It was truly heartbreaking. And uh, in one of the clips, I heard Simon that changed my life. And uh, I'm going to share that quote with you here. And this is what the person said. I never realized I was homeless when I lost my housing, only when I lost my family and friends. I never realized I was homeless when I lost my housing, only when I lost my family and friends. You know, this made sense to me. Uh, it resonated. But I thought, I've never heard any homeless service providers, any government agencies talk about this relational facet of homelessness. If this is true, maybe I could just walk down the street, go up to everyone I see who's visibly homeless and ask, do you have any loved ones that you'd like to reconnect to? And so uh, December, 2014, I decided to do just that. Took a walk down Market Street, downtown San Francisco. That's how I met Jeffrey. I sat down with him. I introduced myself. I said, Jeffrey, um, you know, I'm just walking around asking if anyone would like to reconnect to a loved one. Is there anyone that you haven't seen in a while that you'd like to reconnect to. And he said he hadn't seen his family in 22 years. I said, well, would you like to record a video message to your family? He said, yes, I would. So I sat down with him. I recorded a short video message to his niece, his nephew, his sister, his dad. Um, and I went home that night and uh, I, I did an online search and found a Facebook group connected to Jeffrey's hometown. So I posted the video there with a short note. And what happened next was a miracle because within one hour, that video was shared hundreds of times. It made the local news that night as the leading story. Classmates started commenting, hey, I went to high school with Jeffrey. I work in construction. Does he need a job? I work at the congressman's office. Does he need health care? And someone shared his high school yearbook photo, which you can see at the bottom right there on the screen. 
in the first 20 minutes, his sister got tagged and we got on the phone the next day and she told me Jeffrey had been a missing person for 12 years. And this is broad daylight, downtown San Francisco, a few days before Christmas. So uh, at that point, I was able to help them get on a phone call for the first time in 22 years. A few months later, uh, we were able to get Jennifer to come out to the Bay Area. She and her brother reunited for the first time, 22 years. And I started doing this work full time uh, because I knew Jeffrey wasn't the only one and that this shouldn't be happening. We shouldn't have a crisis that in some ways is so visible, so painful to see, so much suffering. And yet, for the folks who perhaps matter the most to that neighbor experiencing homelessness, uh, they are completely invisible. And so I created a nonprofit uh, along with a wonderful team called Miracle Messages uh, to do the work that really got started nine years ago on that walk down Market Street. And our belief is that everyone is someone, somebody. Uh, everyone we see, that's someone's son or daughter, brother or sister, or maybe some kid's beloved uncle or aunt. And the work we do at Miracle Messages uh, is pretty simple, actually. We do three things. So our, our work is to help people experiencing homelessness rebuild their social support systems and their financial security. And uh, I'm going to share a little bit about each of our three programs with you today. So first is our family and friend reunification services. This is really kind of the flagship program that got started with me wandering down the streets. Fortunately, we have a better mechanism to do it uh, than just some random dude blasting videos around social media, right? So now what we do, um, and, and I'm, I, heard, uh, I, I heard a gentleman uh, during the call share that he it run, he's a private investigator. And uh, I'm very excited, uh, sir, to connect with you and talk further because what we do is we collect messages from people experiencing homelessness all across the country. Could be uh, from caseworkers, social workers, partners that refer to us. They can fill out our online form on our website, miraclemessages.org. They can fill out our paper forms and print them out. Uh, we also have a hotline. Uh, the hotline number is very simple. 1-800-MISS-YOU. 1-800-M-I-S-S-Y-O-U. And that enables our neighbors experiencing homelessness to also reach out and say they'd like to reconnect to a loved one. Our staff is standing by, taking the information. Volunteers, community members can record messages. Once a message comes into our system, we have a network of volunteer digital detectives. And these are folks who make phone calls, write letters, use online people directories and Google search and Facebook and social media to find loved ones, deliver messages, help people reconnect to their family and friends. Uh, the fruits of those efforts over the last nine years has led to over 800 family and friend reunifications. Uh, and it has just been absolutely beautiful to be a part of seeing lives transformed. Most of the loved ones that we reach are excited to reconnect. Uh, and if they aren't, we honor that and we say, you know your relationship better than we do. And uh, it's a double opt-in service. And we've seen folks be, get off the streets, stay off the streets through those reunifications, but also just see improvements in mental health, physical health, and social health. So you may be sitting here thinking, well, this is really nice and sweet and all, but um, how many people can this actually serve uh, that uh, are experiencing homelessness? And you know, for some people experiencing homelessness, family might be part of the problem, not part of the solution. What do you do if your bridges are burned? How do you address this relational poverty piece if family isn't a viable option? Well, that's where we created our second program. And that's in the early months of the pandemic. Uh, we had, as many of you probably know, our unhoused neighbors going into the shelter in place hotels. Uh, it was a very rare moment uh, in, in the world for a variety of reasons. And one of which is uh, we had a surplus of vacant uh, hotel rooms, um, and we had a 
tremendous need and urgency, finally a, an awareness that the well-being of our unhoused neighbors uh, really intersected with our well-being, you know, in terms of public health. Um, and so there was a desire and a, and, a, a, and a groundswell calling for our unhoused neighbors to get housed, which lo and behold, we were able to house thousands and thousands of people in, in a matter of weeks and months uh, in these shelter in place hotels. But the problem is you get someone into a hotel room, four walls and a roof don't make a house a home. Uh, it requires a lot more uh, love, belonging, uh, someone to talk to, someone to help you solve problems, navigate complex systems with, uh, you know, someone to, you know, giving you a reason for getting up in the morning. And our unhoused neighbors were almost entirely isolated. As one person said in the early months of the pandemic, you don't need to teach me about social distancing. That's my life already. And so what we did is we created a program um, that, again, uh, there's a couple calls to action in my talk here. One is being a digital detective, which if you're interested, you can sign up on our website, miraclemessages.org slash get involved. Second one is about to come and it's accessible to anyone or anywhere in the world is our Miracle Friends Phone Buddy program. Miracle Friends matches volunteers uh, around the world, literally Chile, uh, 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 in Europe, um, Bahrain in the Middle East, uh, Asia, Europe, Canada, US, volunteers all over the world, 30 minutes a week, phone calls and text messages with individuals experiencing homelessness, matched one-to-one, -one, kind of like a big brother's big sisters for our unhoused neighbors. But it's all uh, remote, virtual, phone calls, text-based. If you don't feel comfortable giving out your personal phone number, your cell phone number, uh, we actually partner with Dialpad and Google Voice, where you can download an app and then use the phone number in the app for free to make all your phone calls and texts there. We have weekly volunteer support calls, training. There's a log. So every interaction you have, you can just log it into our system uh, on Salesforce. And if there's any issues that you don't feel comfortable dealing with, or perhaps the person has you know, a, a food insecurity and, and is needing food or is having a mental health issue or is depressed or whatever it is, and you just feel it's above your pay grade, uh, you can flag it and a caseworker, a social worker, or a member of our staff will follow up. This program isn't meant to be a replacement for casework or social work. What it's meant to be is a friendship program, a good neighbor program, uh, because we all have experienced loneliness and isolation, and we've all relied on having someone to talk to to get by in life. So this is a program right now uh, that's serving over 350 unhoused individuals around the country uh, with 350 volunteers, 20, 30 minute interactions every week. Uh, and cumulatively, uh, our volunteers have logged probably closer to 200,000 conversation minutes at this point. Uh, the outcomes from this program have truly been remarkable. And as one final plug for this program, if you're interested in volunteering or learning more, we do weekly orientations and trainings. We currently have a wait list of about 20 individuals experiencing homelessness who have raised their hand and said, I'd really like to have someone to talk to. And we don't have enough volunteers. So if you feel it on your heart, uh, we'd very much appreciate your learning more and potentially taking the first step to get involved as a volunteer friend in our Miracle Friends program. And then our third and most recent program has emerged from our Phone Buddy program. And uh, it came about basically from listening to volunteer feedback who basically said, hey, I'm now in a relationship with this person. I love them. I trust them. We're, we're friends. Like we talk about life together. We go through things. They've helped me as much as I've helped them. And the thing is, though, it's very hard for us to be on equal footing as friends if they don't know what they're going to do to get food on the table tonight. And they don't know how they're going to uh, get back to work on Monday because uh, they can't put gas in their car and half of people experiencing homelessness have jobs, which is a stat that 
most people don't maybe realize. So how do we, how can we make sure that they have their basic needs met so that they can be fully themselves in this friendship? They can be on more equal footing. So that's where we created, uh, we said, let's raise some money. You know, not a lot. Let's we raise fifty thousand dollars, okay, on social media. Which you know, I mean, it's it's a decent amount of money, but uh, divided between a handful of people, you know, it doesn't go that far. But we said let's let's select fourteen individuals in our phone buddy program who are nominated by their friends to get five hundred dollars a month for six months, no strings attached. And in what turned out to be the first basic income pilot for individuals experiencing homelessness in the United States. Uh, We gave out $500 a month for six months, 14 individuals. Here's the high level result. Two thirds of our unhoused recipients secured stable housing and all of those individuals are still housed. They use the money better than I could have used it for them. Most of the money was spent on housing uh, some money was spent on food security, and uh, we know that many individuals, the rest of the money they spent on child care, uh, paying down debt, storage costs, emergencies, family emergencies, and even charitable giving. And Elizabeth, who's pictured here, she was our first recipient in our Miracle Money program. The first thing she did with her first payment, she made a donation to Miracle Messages. And when I said, Elizabeth, you didn't need to do this. This wasn't part of the program. She said, well, I didn't do it for you. She said, I did it for myself. So I could once again, feel the dignity of being able to support the causes that I believe in. So that's what we're doing at Miracle Messages. So what's next? And then I want to take your questions and really save most of the time just for conversation. Uh, a couple exciting updates and things to share. I, I hope uh, you know this work resonates with you. I'd love to hear how this resonates with all of you. A uh, few things. So our Miracle Money pilot has expanded. Uh, we have been able to secure $2.1 million, uh, most of it through Google.org, uh, the charitable arm of Google, along with some other great foundations and corporate sponsors and high net worth individuals and everyday people chipping in $50, $100. We've raised $2.1 million to do a randomized control trial of basic income plus social support in the phone, a form of a phone buddy program. So we are working with researchers at University of Southern California, USC School of Social Work uh, to do an RCT, randomized control trial, uh, where we're giving out $750 a month for 12 months to over a hundred unhoused individuals in San Francisco, Oakland, and Los Angeles County. Uh, And uh, we'll have some preliminary results to share in the coming days. Uh, And I'm really excited to share that. You can sign up on our email, uh, get involved form and get our latest updates. You'll see some of the updates. And then we should have the final results towards the end of next year. Uh, And if folks are interested in sponsoring an unhoused neighbor in that program, you can always make a donation or learn more at our website, miraclemessages.org. Next, we have just announced an expansion into Santa Cruz. So this work, Miracle Messages, our reunion services, our phone buddy program, they're available to anyone, anywhere, uh, nationwide. And even we've served some folks overseas. Uh, But we also realize that having boots on the ground, having Uh, outreach workers and deep partnerships in a few communities allows this work to be even more accessible. So we received some uh, philanthropic uh, contributions from 1440 Foundation, uh, which is part of 1440 Multiversity, kind of a retreat center for Silicon Valley uh, tech workers. And they have uh, contributed enough to us to hire a full-time outreach worker in Santa Cruz, We are partnering with a lot of great organizations and government agencies in Santa Cruz County to offer our services in the county. Uh, So that's an exciting update. Uh, And also, and really, I think one of the uh, things I wanted to share about today, and maybe we could talk more in the discussion, is my new book, When We Walk By, Forgotten Humanity, Broken Systems, and the Role We Can Each Play 
in ending homelessness in America. Uh, that's a QR code. If you're uh, savvy on tech stuff and you want to just pull up your QR code to order a copy, you can. That goes to the website, or I put it in the chat. Um, and really, the big ideas in the book are, are a couple things. So first, homelessness at some level, uh, it's widely misunderstood. What causes homelessness? Who our unhoused neighbors are? Uh, what what's uh, what to say to someone who's experiencing homelessness? So the book really tries to debunk a lot of misconceptions and myths and really get the record straight. It also really makes the argument that homelessness in some levels can be understood as perhaps the most intersectional issue of our time. So what does that mean? If we think about all the systems in our society that aren't working well, from housing, affordable housing, where there's a nationwide shortage of 7 million units to meet current demand, income inequality, uh, where uh, there's not a single county in the United States where of the 3,000 plus counties where someone who's working full-time at a minimum wage job can afford the fair market value rent of a two-bedroom apartment and less than 1% of counties where that same hardworking individual at full-time federal minimum wage job can afford a one-bedroom apartment. Uh, criminal justice system where there's a revolving door between homelessness and incarceration that disproportionately affects uh, black and brown people in the United States. And we see similar numbers of people who are homeless, disproportionately black and brown, as we do in incarceration. So we go through, and foster care, that's one more system just to mention, uh, one out of every three kids who age out of foster care will experience homelessness by the time they're 26 years old. And for black young people who age out of foster care, that number goes up to 60%. So we look at all the systems that basically all roads can lead to homelessness of these broken systems. But homelessness isn't just a byproduct of broken systems, as maybe you've kind of inferred from my conversation, our, our talk today. It's also a byproduct of what we talk about of our forgotten humanity. We don't know who they are. We create binaries between the homeless and, I guess, us as the housed, right? We, we don't really talk about ourselves as housed people, but we do have this entire group of human beings that we've clumped together into a very monochromatic uh, group that we call the homeless. Um, and then there's levels of exclusion, relational poverty, uh, paternalism, and, and even rugged individualism gone a little too far, where if we have a notion of self-made man, self-made woman in our society, then uh, what does that mean for someone who's poor? or someone who's homeless? Are they deservedly poor? Are they self-failed as an individual? And it sounds awful to articulate, but really that's the implications of the kind of sociology, the, the mindset around homelessness in the United States. So try to debunk all that. And really it's a hopeful book at the end of the day, because it shows here's what each of us can do to make a difference in the lives of our unhoused neighbors. Uh, so uh, in closing, and again, I'd love to take your questions, comments, reflections, our unhoused neighbors, they're not problems to be solved. They're people to be loved. And I argue that if you love people, if you get close enough to see someone as someone's son or daughter, brother or sister, or some kid's beloved uncle, we actually will make a difference and actually make progress on this human rights crisis of our time embracing our unhoused neighbors, not as problems, but as people. Uh, so that's the work we do at Miracle Messages. And I'm happy to answer any questions and stay around. So thank you all. Thank you so, oh my gosh. Let's give uh, Kevin a round of applause. That was unbelievable. Uh, taught me and I'm sure everyone here a huge, many huge lessons. And I have so many reactions, but I'll try to keep my uh, comments brief so other people can ask questions. First of all, I spoke recently at a conference called Municipal Managers Association of Northern California. I know they'd love to know about you. As I did my pre-conference work, homeless, homelessness was the number one problem that was expressed to me by various cities in California, and I'd love to refer you to them. I know they'd love to have you speak at a conference or do a webinar or whatever it is you want to do. The other thing is you may or may not know that there are volunteer matching programs. Um, I don't remember the exact name of this program, but I'll find it for you. 
Uh, back when I worked at Levi Strauss, they had a volunteer matching program for employees who wanted to do volunteer work. And I know that other companies do as well in terms of your need for volunteers. And uh, that's all I wanted to tell you. <laughs> and I'd love to um, do some blogging about you. And so we can talk offline about that and learn about you in the book and what you're trying to do. And I see Patricia has her hand up, please, Patricia. What a wonderful speaker you are. You're very charismatic and you're doing God's work. I had to race and get a tissue because I was in tearing up for a lot of your presentation. Two, two questions. One, I live in the sunset, which has a few homeless people, not too many. And I do walk around with dollar bills in my, in my jacket to give to musicians and homeless people who look not scary. I'll say that, not scary. What, I usually say good luck, something like that. What would you say is the appropriate action for a senior citizen woman walking through her neighborhood when we see someone, you know, with a sign or just sitting there? That's the first question. Secondly, like many people here, I am very concerned with the bad press we get about the homelessness, which is affecting tourism. And uh, many of us are in the meetings industry and we see San Francisco that used to be one of the top three convention spots is now way down. So one, what do we do? Two, how can we what can we do about the bad press we get? That's great. Well, thank thank you very much. And uh, we thought about before doing miracle messages branded Kleenexes or tissues for the uh, tears. So uh, th thank you for sharing and and really great questions. Um, you know, and and I'll I, I, there's no way I can do them full justice. Those are some of the existential questions of our day right now, right? So I'm going to just share a few reflections. Uh, and invite anyone else in the chat to share their thoughts and we can keep the conversation going. So uh, I think one thing that's maybe worthwhile to mention is a few years ago, uh, San Francisco uh, commissioned a study, a survey of panhandlers, you know, people asking for charity on how money was used, who they are, what their situation was like. So just a few stats to share from that. And this is all in the book, so I, I'm going to probably get most of the stats roughly right, but you know, feel free to fact check me and, and double check. So uh, first, about 95% of people who are panhandling in San Francisco um, live in San Francisco. So just, you know, I know sometimes there's this mindset, are people move, you know, coming in in their Mercedes Benz and panhandling and then going elsewhere? Not the case. Uh, the vast majority of them are experiencing homelessness in San Francisco. Um, when asked if the people, the individuals would accept housing if offered to them, that was in a way that was, you know, clean and safe and, you know, had a lock on the door, you know, or the, just some kind of, you know, safety. 97% of panhandlers said, yes, I would absolutely love housing. Uh, so that I just wanted to share those as kind of misconceptions. Most of the money that's spent uh, on panhandling, and most 85% uh, of people said that they use some of the money for food, so food security. And I think it was around 60%, maybe 50%, about half said they used some of the money on some form of drugs or substance addiction, right? So it, it's kind of up to us. Um, you know, do we, do we, uh, you could use our discretion. Uh, we could also say, at some level, my job is to do the charitable act and how they use the money is, is their prerogative. I'm, you know, giving just a few dollars, it's not going to make a huge difference. And a lot of it is spent on food. But you know, what I often do is I bring socks as the number one requested physical item on the streets. Uh, we partner with Bombas and I have thousands and thousands of socks. Uh, these are ones specifically designed with antimicrobial properties to be worn in inclement weather because our unhoused neighbors are on their feet. It gets soggy. They don't, they can't change. They can't shower easily and they can get some really awful 
foot infections and abscess and this all sorts of disgusting, you know, awful things. And so just having a pair of clean socks, I find is a really nice conversation starter. You know, I'll say, Hey, would you like a pair of socks? And um, leave it at that. And if the person says yes, and they seem like they're open to having a conversation, you know, that's maybe where I'll say, you know, hi, my name is Kevin. What's your name? And and I've learned actually, I, I used to ask, like, how are you doing? But you know, a person experiencing homelessness probably is having a pretty rough day. Uh, it, it could be a very traumatizing, otherizing experience, you know, physically and emotionally, spiritually. Uh, so a, a question that I ask, ask now more often is, what are your plans for today? Uh, because that actually kind of pushes it like, well, you know, do you have, what are your goals? What are you looking to, forward towards? What, what things are you navigating? Maybe I can help. Um, and again, not trying to come in with any kind of savior complex, but really just being neighborly. And, and I heard uh, someone in a talk the other day say, uh, smiling is cheap and empathy is free. So at the very end of the day, just, you know, being able to make eye contact, uh, if you don't feel comfortable, uh, you know, we, you don't have to talk to everyone. The, the implications of my book, when we walk by, isn't when we stop and talk to every single person, <laughs> never, never walk by. Right. So inevitably we walk by, I think it's just being more mindful as you are doing in, in your comment of, well, why did I walk by? Is it, is it I'm busy? Is it, I have somewhere to go? Is it that I felt afraid? And if I felt afraid, why did I feel afraid? Is it something, you know, I'll just share and, and kind of go on to the next question. The first time I met someone experiencing homelessness to wear the GoPro cameras, I found myself instinctively reaching my hand into my pocket and grabbing my keys as a weapon. Okay. I, I'm a six foot two uh, guy. Like I usually don't have concerns for my well-being, walking around city streets at night, like whenever. This was in broad daylight in the Castro at a corner right by the uh, Molly Stone's uh, supermarket, I think it was. And I found myself grabbing my keys and holding them as a weapon. That's where I started on this issue. So I think, uh, you know, I'm not ashamed. I mean, I'm not proud of that. I'm a, you know, it's, it's, it's not the great uh, place to, to be, but that's where I started on this issue. So if you don't feel comfortable talking to someone on the streets, just know that the vast majority of people experiencing homelessness are invisible to us. They're trying to blend in and not be seen as homeless. So if that means, you know, maybe volunteering in our phone buddy program, going to a soup kitchen, a shelter, and getting to know unhoused neighbors that way as a starting point, I think that's also a great way to go. Um, and then just briefly, I, I, I'm not in city government. I, uh, you know, have been as, uh, working as a social entrepreneur, as an author uh, for the last decade. Uh, you know, I think my general thought is the the situation on the streets that we see every day is not in the best interest of anyone. That's hurting our unhoused neighbors as much, if not more, than the rest of us as housed people. Uh, you know, any crime that occurs involving a person experiencing homelessness, mo most of the time, the person experiencing homelessness is the victim of that crime uh, mm -hmm. from from a housed perpetrator. Uh, and, you know, it's incredibly dangerous on the streets. Uh, women, you know, the sexual assault rates are upwards of 95% uh, for women on the streets, you know, have some kind of assault. So I know there's, you know, this intersects with mental health, untreated mental health issues, substance abuse issues. Um, as you'll read in the book, there's some things I call on that are fairly controversial. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, against kind of what's prevailing in the city. So I am both uh, someone who's not in favor of uh, raise, making it illegal to be homeless. I don't think we should be enforcing anti-camping, anti-sleeping, anti-loitering, anti-feeding legislation because fundamentally we have not built places for people to go. It's whack-a-mole. Um, but I also... A call for a crackdown on any form of drug dealing on the streets. Um, and uh, I do talk about a, a, a limited but important role of uh, an expanded way of involuntary holds and involuntary treatment and hospitalization. Uh, the, and, and my perspective on this has been shaped almost entirely by family members who have basically said, um, you know, I, I, I don't want my, per my loved one living and dying on the streets. This is no quality of life for them. 
you know, the asterisk on that is it has to be weighed with questions of autonomy. Have you uh, tried every past thing or is the person pres- harm to themselves or to others? Um, and the most important thing is what's the plan after the involuntary hold? What, you know, you can't just hold people inevitably. We don't want to go back to one flew over the cuckoo's nest. So is there housing at the end of the process? Is there treatment? Are we actually going to fulfill the vision of deinstitutionalization, which was a nationwide system of community recovery programs? Because if you don't have a good viable plan for what happens afterwards, you can't just be rounding people up. Uh, so anyways, I, I, we could have a longer conversation. A lot of this is in the book, but uh, I appreciate the really thoughtful question. So, Thank you so much. Next up is Anastasia, then Susan, then Tom Jacob. Thank you, Kevin. This was amazing. Um, I've had very personal connections to it. My ex-husband uh, was homeless uh, after we, we our marriage ended. Um, and so my daughter had to deal with her father on the streets. And recently through DNA, was able to find a full-blooded uncle and connected with his daughters. And he's been uh, homeless for years and they were trying to trying to reconnect with him and get him off the streets. And he just died on the streets about six months ago. So she never had that opportunity to connect. Sorry. But this, this issue is real, you know, and I, I know what it's like to have someone that I love being gone and lost and not knowing where he is sleeping under a, a bridge somewhere, uh, you know, on a park bench. And um, it's not always people that, that choose this life. And yet yeah. some do. So I, I managed programs for the Salvation Army for food. And I remember meeting one of the homeless people that was helping us and he was getting some food out and stuff. And he he chose that life. And so I know you you run into this all the time. And and I love the fact that you you have that it's got to be a two-way opt-in mm-hmm. because some people either side might not be ready for that. But mm-hmm. this this program is incredible what you're doing to um, help connect people. So I'm curious about a couple of things. First off, um, are you involved or connected with things like, I'm I'm involved with a tiny home program. We're building tiny Mm -hmm. homes in Albany, Oregon, where I am right now, fashioned after hugely successful programs in Eugene, Oregon. So I don't, I'm not in the San Francisco Bay area anymore. And I don't know if you have anything like that, where it's, they, they have tiny homes to live into permanently uh, and they get their dignity back because they're part of this. They help build these homes. They have commitments to volunteering and 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 mm-hmm. and paying towards it. All that. Um, and and uh, a point in time. Are you involved in a point in time? And some of our our members here might not even be aware of what that is. And maybe they can even participate because that's coming up next month. Yeah. Um. So and last thing. This this buddy system, because it's all virtual, I'm assuming like somebody could be in Maryland and supporting somebody in San Francisco, right? E- so even the Marylanders, we'll let them in. The Terrapins, come on in. Yeah, okay, no problem. Okay. So if you could just kind of if, fill, fill us in on some of those things, I would sure. really appreciate it. So the, the connectivity, if you will, in all of yeah, that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, that's great well, questions okay. and great. To, thank you again for helping me make this happen. You've, you've been wonderful in setting this up. Um, so uh, I'm going to try to answer it in kind of lightning round fashion because I want to get to everyone's questions. But you got some really good meaty <laughs> questions there. I don't. I can't do it in 140 characters or less. I promise. Um, but I'll try. So uh, first, um, yeah. I, I mean, I'm so sorry for your loss. I think most people, when we actually think about it, that there's someone that we know, loved one who has either experienced homelessness or could have experienced homelessness if it weren't for a support community. Um, And in fact, some of us on this call may have had brushes of homelessness or housing insecurity. So uh, I appreciate you, you know, sharing your, your connection to this issue and your, you know, very personal connection. You know, homelessness is not a lifestyle. It's a death sentence. Uh, The average life expectancy on the streets is 50 years. Very, 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 very few people choose this as a lifestyle. Um, and the question of choice is interesting here. And again, you know your relationship better than I do. So I don't know, you know, uh, you know the story of, of, of your ex and, and you know the history and context. But I'll just speak in general. Um, you know, 
young, there's estimated 11% of the nationwide youth population is LGBTQ, but over 40% of the youth homeless population is LGBTQ. So those 40%, a lot of those individuals have left unsafe home environments. Um, are they choosing to leave, right? Are they choosing to be away from loved ones? Well, yeah, but the choice isn't very good. Um, you know, one out of every two Americans are a paycheck away from not being able to pay rent. 47% of people say they don't know where they get $400 for an unexpected emergency. Uh, it's actually surprising that tens of millions of people aren't homeless. We, we should actually ask the question, why aren't more people experiencing homelessness instead of why are so many people experiencing homelessness? Because one out of two people are paycheck away from not paying rent. We're finding family, friends, community, church, synagogue, mosque, informal economy, relationships it's making up the difference. But, um, you know, when someone gets into an argument with a loved one or has a falling out, it makes it that much harder to stay in, uh, in, in housing. The threshold is that much less if you're barely getting by financially. Um, so, you know, I, I just want to mention some of those stats and, and just, you know, the life expectancy on the streets, because very few people, even if they say they are, they're doing this, they want to, it's a lifestyle, it's a choice. Most of them, when you actually drill down, they, they have a bad choice and a worse choice. And they're just choosing, you know, the, the least worst of those choices. Um, in terms of you know getting involved in miracle messages in our miracle friends program, anyone can get involved anywhere they are. Uh, we ask for about a three month commitment just because we don't want people rotating in in and out of the friendships. Our unhoused neighbors, you will likely be the only person that they have as a friend uh, that isn't a government caseworker. You know, one of the best practices that we draw on in this work is from the foster care youth space where the best practice is, does that child have someone who goes to bed at night and wakes up in the morning thinking of their well-being, who isn't paid to do so? And I just think there's not a point as adults that we ever age out of the need to feel loved, uh, to feel like someone's got our back. Uh, so that's really your job as a volunteer phone buddy is just to be that, that friend, to, to, to be a supporter. Um, and you can do it from anywhere in the world, uh, including in Maryland. So. Thank you so much. Next up is Susan and then Tom Jacobs. Um, Kevin, uh, I just want to say to you that you do your mother and Uncle Mark proud. And they are, that you have responded in such a manner is amazing. This, I can't help but um, thinking California, I just went and looked, I knew it, but I want to be sure. Uh, California spends the most on the homeless, unhoused. San Francisco is, by the way, not the most unhoused. We're number three on the list. But I am wondering, are you the recipient of any of the vast amount of funds the city of San Francisco gives, or do you want to keep separate and keep government out of what you do? That's number one. Um, I also had a opportunity. Everyone knows I love to listen to smart people. I listened to Willie Brown, who said 25 years ago when he was mayor, he went to a mayor's conference to learn how to be mayor. And what he learned from mayors from all over the country is homelessness is an intractable problem. And it's gotten even more so. But I love what you said is we tend not to look at people. We tend not to notice their humanity. I'm going to try and do better on that. But I would just like to know how, how the government is responding to your success, our San Francisco government, or is it caught up in the, excuse me, bull, bull pucky of, <laughs> you know what I wanted to say, yeah. of, of bureaucracy? Yeah, thanks, Susan. Well, thanks for, um, I, I think you you and uh, my mom uh, would have gotten along very well. You two would have enjoyed a, a good cup of tea and a rabble rousing if you're breaking into churches too. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, 
the, the, so financially, almost all of our funds are a combination of foundation gifts, uh, as well as individual donations. Uh, we have very little government funding. Uh, we'd be very open to government funding. Uh, mm -hmm. most government, uh, uh, grants and kind of the procurement and RFP process. It's not for anything close to what we do. It's not just like help us end homelessness. It's build housing or build a detox center or, you know, create outreach. And we just don't fit the bill for a lot of those services and programs. And we have not uh, found government, local government officials to be receptive enough to saying let's let's work together to change that um you know i think initially uh san francisco you know when i started this work uh when it was just the reunion services i think they looked at it as like a nice to have not essential um i think that's starting to change because if you look at the city's own stats uh between 2015 and 2019 60 percent of successful shelter exits in san francisco were as a result of family and friend reunification, ah, okay. 60%, 30% permanent supportive housing, 10% transitional housing, 60% family reunifications. That's not us, by the way, that's mostly homeward bound, which up until re was discontinued. And I think they're finally bringing back. And that's a drop in the bucket in the city's budget. That's a couple million dollars a year program. So I think this role of relationships, social support, it's very easy to take it for granted if you have if you have it right. Our unhoused neighbors, when you actually listen to them and what why they became homeless, about one in three people experiencing homelessness cite the cause of their homelessness as some kind of relational breakdown. You know, a death in the family, a suicide, an argument, a divorce, a separation, a falling out. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's an isolating experience. The relational piece is key. And I think it goes back to, was it Fripp or Patricia, the, the question earlier, um, just to, to raise one element that I think we could do better as a city. For nine years doing this work, you know, we really have been banging on the door of the city, like, help us help you. Remember that scene in Jerry Maguire? <laughs> help me help you, right? Like, we're not trying to throw shade on you guys. We're not trying to make your life harder. We are a community of citizens, everyday people, residents who want to make a difference. One thing I think that we should do much more of is we should involve everyday people on this issue. Like I've had so much, so many conversations where the presumption that, you know, almost posture is like, well, we know what we're doing. Just, you know, leave us alone. Well, no, you don't. Because we can see it on our streets that homelessness is growing. It's not being resolved. We're spending, as you mentioned, hundreds of millions of dollars a year and have very little to show for it. Um, I think the pent up energy and frustration needs to be converted to action and involving everyday people. Uh, and that's why at Miracle Messages, our mission is very much twofold. We say no one goes through homelessness alone. You know, and I wish I could end that a word early. No one goes through homelessness, but the reality is homelessness is going to be here for a little longer, or at least for the foreseeable future. It should not be an isolating, otherizing experience. And no one should feel helpless on this issue, meaning us as house people. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I appreciate your, your question and your heart clearly for this issue and uh, hope we can find ways to work together. You know, I just want to say, Patricia and I used, always went to comedy shows, and Doug Ferrara um, was one of the winners, um, and someone noticed him. He became unhoused, mm. but the comedian community gathered, and then they identified him. They uh, He struggled with mental issues, but then he became housed because the community yeah. reached out and noticed him. And we remember his act um, was not one of my favorites, but but combined with the mental, it caused this. But it was this community that pulled together and said, "How could this happen to one of us?" Yeah, and and that's and that's what we need nationwide uh, because you know whether you're a comedian or just a mother, an artist, a 
caseworker. One of the most powerful videos I've seen around homelessness was out of Florida, where they had uh, the person write on a cardboard sign who they were before they became homeless or part of their identity you wouldn't know. And they held up the sign. And it, you know, it had, I was a linebacker for the Buffalo Bills. You know, I gave up my three children to save them from domestic violence. Um, I, you know, uh, I, I, I'm autistic. Uh, I'm an artist. I'm a computer programmer. I'm a recent graduate of University of Florida, right? And the most painful cardboard sign I ever saw, that's kind of the flip of that. I, I saw this walking down the street one day. The person in the sign just said, at least give me the finger. Wow. Wow. Can you Kevin. imagine getting to a place where you're so otherized that you'd rather have a yeah. middle finger in your face than what you have, which is being ignored? I can't. Yeah. Right. Thank see, you, there's Kevin. one or two more questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thomas. We have three minutes left and I want to get Tom's question well, in and then we can it. wrap up. So yep. what do you do about people that don't want help? I've got personal experience. I took a formerly homeless, homeless person into my house for nine years. And Wayne uh, was schizophrenic, uh, a good schizophrenic, not a dangerous person. I got to know him through my dental practice. He found me as a dentist. He looked in the phone book. He's a Bible scholar. He's a genius. One time he wrote down all the chapters in the Bible from memory, al wow. alphabetically. Wow. And, so, and so he... Uh, he came in and he saw the name Jacobs and he thought of the biblical Jacob and that's how he came to me. So, mm. you know, I'd help him out with his teeth and he'd play his flute in the bark station and come and pay his dental bill. And it became kind of a fixture. Uh, yeah. I got well, I, I, got, I think I, 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 you and I are going to need to do some time for storytelling together because you got, you got a couple of them. I can well, tell. Anyway, no, it's a great question. Is, so, so how, I, I how do you help? Yeah, how do you help someone?